Well, I'm delighted that you're considering the possibility of gospel ministry in independent churches. I know that some of you may well already be very familiar with independent churches. Perhaps some of you don't know a great deal about independency. What I want to speak about is why we should um, consider independent ministry, what it means and what the advantages of independent ministry are. First of all, what does it mean to be an independent church? Well, to be an independent church means to be um, a, a, a local church which is autonomous and self-governing. Jesus Christ is the head of his church and he rules his church through his word and by his spirit. But the fundamental conviction of independence is that there is no external human authority over local churches. In other kind of models of church, there's some kind of um, external authority over the local church, whether that be a denomination, perhaps a bishop or a, a presbytery structure. But in the uh, understanding of independence, um, the local church is autonomous under the rule of Christ, which means that the key decisions in the life of the local church are a matter for the local church. The local church is um, uh, under Christ able to determine um, its doctrine, the appointment of uh, its leaders and who should minister in the church, who should be um, a member and accepted as belonging to the church, um, the exercise of church discipline, the use of money and the way that the church is structured. Now, this idea of um, uh, independency is not some strange or novel or new form of church nor is it just a reaction against the perceived failings of other church structures. Independency came about because of people's biblical conviction that this was the way God had said churches ought to be established and organised. Independency goes back to the 16th century and to the time of the Reformation, when people began to go back to the Bible, not just to recover doctrine, but to think about how churches should be organised. And uh, uh, in that time, people came to the conviction that the Bible taught that churches should be autonomous and self-governing under Christ. People like uh, Oliver Cromwell and the great English theologian uh, John Owen were independents who came to these convictions. Historically, in, in England, independency uh, really took two different routes. There were two different branches. There were congregationalists who were Peter Baptists and believed that the children of believers should be baptised. And then there were Baptists who believed that baptism should be on the basis of personal profession of faith in Christ. Over time, other groups of independent churches emerged. The brethren, uh, non-denominational churches, more recently house church groups. Worldwide, independency is the largest form of church structure. It's estimated there are something like 545 million evangelical Christians in the world, and of those, 275 million are in independent churches. In the UK today, there are more than 5,500 uh, independent churches. So independency is not something new, uh, and nor is it something um, small and unusual. Well, who then should be uh, in independent church ministry? Well, those who are convinced that this really is the biblical pattern for church. I think that choosing where to minister as a gospel minister is not simply a pragmatic decision. It's not simply a question of choosing what looks like the best boat to fish from or who's able to pay for your training and provide security in a job. I think we need to be uh, sure that where we're biblically, where we're um, ministering is uh, faithful to the biblical teaching about what church ought to be like. So who should be serving in independent churches in gospel ministry? Well, those who are convinced that this uh, model of independency is what the Bible teaches about how churches should be organized. Well, what are the advantages of independent churches? I'm convinced that not only is independency biblical, but there are a number of advantages that independent churches enjoy that are particularly relevant in our current post-Christian secular context. The advantages that independent uh, churches enjoy are, are the freedoms that they have, because there is no external authority over the local church. 
That means that independent churches are free to be faithful to scripture. Many churches that are in denominations and organizations are facing battles over key biblical doctrines. And local churches have to submit to what the denomination or the group decides. Many churches are struggling over the whole issue of same-sex marriage and whether same-sex relationships should be recognized and accepted within the church. In independent churches, there isn't that external uh, pressure. Churches are free to uh, faithfully reflect the teachings of scripture. Nobody can make them adopt any other doctrine. Within the uh, FIEC, our churches are united by our common uh, statement of faith, which defines the uh, core beliefs that evangelicals have held to for the last three centuries. We're free to stand firm for those gospel convictions and no local church can be forced to uh, uh, adopt any other beliefs. Secondly, uh, independent churches are free to be diverse. The freedom that they have allows them to be able to um, obey scripture in conscience on a whole variety of secondary issues. As we've seen, not every independent church will take the same position. There's always been a diversity of view in relation to baptism within independent churches. There's diversity over the exact way that local churches should be governed, whether that is by the congregation or by elders or by a combination of both. Independent churches are free to reach their own convictions under scripture on issues like eschatology, whether they're Calvinistic or Arminian in salvation, whether they're cessationist or continuationist in regard to the, the, the gifts of the spirit. Being independent is only one aspect of a church's identity. That freedom to be diverse also extends to the freedom to be diverse in culture. Independent churches don't have to be defined by nationality or ethnicity or class or education or social status. That freedom gives scope for great diversity at a local church level. They're also free to be flexible in ministry. Churches don't have to do things in the approved way. Independent churches are free to develop their structure, their services, their worship styles in a way that they believe reflects scripture and that is contextually appropriate. They're free to uh, plant, free to uh, appoint ministers without the need for external permission. There isn't a parish structure, which means there are no territorial conflicts uh, when they want to begin new gospel works. Independent churches are also free to partner with others in ministry. They're free to be able to join with others who share their common gospel uh, convictions. But at the same time, they're not forced to partner with those um, who don't. And they enjoy the freedom to uh, fail. Independent churches have the ability to be able to innovate, to try things, to take risks, because they don't have an institutional vested interest that makes them uh, completely risk averse. Well, there are those advantages and freedoms uh, of independency. There's no doubt that there are at the same time dangers of independency, perhaps the uh, danger of isolationism and not relating to others. The danger of a, a lack of uh, accountability, which can lead to uh, false teaching and heresy. But independents believe that some of those dangers can be mitigated or overcome. Independent churches, although there's no external authority over the local church, have often had a relational or an informal accountability. And groups like FIEC exist to be able to overcome some of those disadvantages. From the 16th century, independent churches have joined together in associations or unions to enable them to work together and to cooperate with one another without compromising their freedom. Again, we believe that follows the pattern of the New Testament, where churches were in relationship with one another, with a sort of fellowship and partnership cooperating in gospel ministry and church planting uh, and training and recognizing leaders. The FIEC it, itself was founded in 1922 to enable churches to provide uh, kind of mutual support to one another. 
That's why our, our vision today is to be independent churches working together to reach Britain for Christ. And today, there are some 630 churches that are affiliated to FIEC. Over the last 10 years, more than 130 new churches have joined it. And uh, uh, when they tell us why they've joined, they're, they're for the same reasons. Time and time again, they say they want to belong to FIEC because they want to stand together with like-minded gospel churches. They want the uh, voluntary accountability. All of our churches every year have to reaffirm that they stand um, uh, uh, and agree with our statement of faith. They have a shared gospel vision for the nation and want to work together to see it realised because they know that they can do more together than they could on their own. They want to take advantage of the help and support that FIEC offers, the help and support that can come from other churches and from the FIEC staff. But also they want to be able to offer support to others, praying for others, perhaps sharing finance, perhaps providing people, sharing their expertise and experience. So independent churches believe that they're following the biblical pattern for how church ought to be organised. They enjoy many freedoms that are a benefit for gospel ministry. And some of the disadvantages can be overcome as they join together in associations to be able to support and encourage one another. I hope that helps you to understand what independent churches are and what the advantages of independent ministry might be. And I pray that God will help you as you think through whether he's calling you to be a gospel minister in an independent context.